in the um, symposium put on by the Journal of uh, Criminal Law and Policy. Uh, my name is Lucy Rica. I'm the executive director of the Center on the Legal Profession here at the law school. Um, I have a couple of thank yous to make. Um, first of all, I don't get to work to, with students much in my job, but I got, did to put this on, and it was a great experience. The students who have put together this symposium um, have an extraordinary amount of ingenuity and passion and commitment. Um, and so I'd like to thank each one of them, Nick and Sarah, Riley, Jenny, Jenna, etc. cetera. Um, and I'd also like to thank um, ACS and uh, my colleague, Debbie Mukamal of the Criminal Justice Center. They're all co-sponsoring this event. Um, I'd like to thank each of the panelists for making it here today. We have a lot of people who traveled in. Especially, I'd like to thank Laura Duffy um, for coming up from San Diego um, when there's a lot going on down there with the fires uh, t yesterday and today. And um, our thoughts are with everybody in San Diego. So thank you. Um, and finally, I really need to thank IT and facilities. This has been a big day at the law school, and they are running around. And so thanks to them very much. And now I'd like to introduce Lori Levinson. Um, I'm going to be very brief in the introduction so we can get started. Lori is a professor at Loyola Law School, and she um, is here because I was talking to Larry Marshall and said, I really, really need a strong person to moderate this debate. And Larry said, I've got exactly the person for you. <laughs> so uh, let's get started. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, my name is Lori Levinson. I am delighted and honored to be here. This is an exciting debate to have over the noon hour. And you will be participating as well in this way. At the appropriate time, you have two ballots in front of you. You will vote at two different times. You will not submit two ballots at the same time. That's for Chicago, not here. <laughs> um, so what we will be doing is having an appropriate debate on our topic for today, the motion, good people should not be prosecuted. That's the motion. And in terms of the nature of this topic, indeed it is provocative, as every good debate topic should be. Uh, there's something evidently about the work of prosecutors or the impact of prosecutors that demands that we address this motion. And of course, there are many different types of prosecutors there are local prosecutors, there are federal prosecutors, and we might even learn today what good people mean. But it is a debate that crosses many lines and something we should address. And to do so, we have an amazing panel of people to debate. I'm going to briefly introduce them and ask them to provide one minute of why they're at the table. And when they're done with that, I'm going to survey you on this basic motion where you will answer yes or no and pass your results to the end of the row. After that, we will start our formal debate. So at this point, let me introduce our panelists. In favor of the motion, we welcome Professor Paul Butler from Georgetown University, who may I add at one time actually served as a prosecutor and is an expert on the issues of race and criminal justice as well as the author of How Can You Prosecute Those People? Pro Professor Butler. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Paul Butler, and I represent the United States. That's how I used to start my opening statement. I represented the government and criminal court in the District of Columbia, and I used that power to put black people in prison, and Latinos, and poor people. Like a lot of prosecutors, that was the majority of my work. During the time I did that work, I learned some things that changed the ways I felt about my responsibilities as a lawyer, as an American, as an African American, and as a person who wants to make a difference in this world. I'm here to tell you what I learned. Thank you, Professor Butler. Joined with Professor Butler in favor of the motion is the Executive Director and Attorney-in-Chief for the Federal Defenders of New York, someone who has previously taught here at Stanford Law School, in fact, started the first trial-level criminal defense clinic. Please join me in welcoming David Patton. Thank you. Um, and uh, I'm here uh, as much as anything because of my experience here at Stanford. Uh, it was a terrific time. Uh, and uh, Stanford holds a special place in my heart because of what has gone on here with clinical education. Uh, uh, largely because of the efforts 
of Larry Marshall. And uh, if you're not aware of that, you should be. Um, frankly, he's a heroic figure as far as I'm concerned in legal education. In terms and yet of- you take me on today. <laughs> <laughs> and yet I will wear it as a badge of honor as he beats up on me uh, in, in this debate. Uh, so I'm just pleased to be back here at Stanford. It's a topic criminal justice in general that I care passionately about, that I've devoted my career to, and so I'm excited to be here to talk about it all. Thank you, David. Arguing against the motion will be Professor Larry Marshall here of Stanford University, also the co-founder of Northwestern Center on Wrongful Convictions, and frankly, a leader in the innocence community. Please join me in welcoming Professor Larry Marshall. What are you doing here? I am here, perhaps in an unexpected position for some, because for 23 years I have worked with prosecutors on large cases of innocent people on death row, on smaller cases involving more run-of-the-mill, and I've come to understand the profound difference it makes when one is dealing with a prosecutor who has sensibilities, humanity, goodness, versus one who seems to lack those attributes. Lives change when good people become prosecutors, and I want to talk to you about that. Thank you, Professor Marshall. And last, we welcome the United States Attorney for the Southern District of California, Laura Duffy, who has served as a prosecutor with the Department of Justice for 21 years. Welcome, Ms. Duffy, your opening remarks. Good afternoon, everybody, and thank you for being here and and having this important discussion. Um, When I was uh, in law school, I clerked for the public defender uh, in the area that I went to law school in, and it was through that experience uh, that I came to know in my heart that I wanted to be a prosecutor, and it's not because, as you might think, that I was so turned off by that experience, but the passion and the commitment that the public defender who I clerked for had for his clients, uh, his commitment to seeing that every person that he represented received due process and that his constitutional rights uh, were respected uh, is what led me to want to bring that kind of commitment and that kind of passion to the other side of the table. And I believed um, that given my experience in working for him and given um, some of my beliefs and uh, attributes that I had, that I would be able to make a difference in my community as a prosecutor. Thank you, Ms. Duffy. Now, those are just the introductory remarks. It's time for you to actually vote on this motion. You have paper in front of you. So your totally uninformed decision at this point, the motion, good people should not be prosecutors. Please fill that out now and pass it to the end of the row. Do so quickly so we can start with the actual debate. And no peeking. Do you have some that are done? <laughs> <laughs> oh, when you begin, you come up here. Step ahead of me. It doesn't matter what the raw numbers no, are. Exactly. Thank, Thank you very much. Quickly, quickly. Quickly, quickly. Yeah. quickly, yeah. quickly. Yeah. quickly, quickly. Yeah. Oh, we don't know. Shh. More of them. Yeah. I think we are ready. Are we ready? Excellent. We are now going to proceed with seven-minute opening arguments by each of the panelists. We will start with Professor Butler in favor of the motion. Professor Butler. I was hired to be a black prosecutor, and I was a damn good one. That's because I was good at performing both those aspects of my job description. The Supreme Court has thought about the importance of having African American participants in the criminal justice system. It's useful to have black support, says, because our presence promotes the appearance that the system is fair. The court says that the people should have more confidence in American criminal justice when they see African Americans represented. So in DC, we had a lot of people who were concerned about racial justice. If you go to criminal court in DC, just like many other big cities, you would think that white people don't commit crimes. White people don't get into, don't use drugs, don't get into fights, don't steal from their offices. They're so good. But Latinos and blacks, man, those are some bad dudes. But our jurors in D.C., they know that's not how the world works. The most dangerous and immoral people in our country are not disproportionately black and Latino. 
even though that's what the justice system tells us. So one reason I was hired is for everybody to see this beautiful chocolate skin. It was supposed to send a message to those jurors, everything's cool, don't be concerned, go to sleep. My friends, everything is so not cool. The United States has the highest rate of incarceration in the world. We have 5% of the world's population and 25% of the world's prisoners. Punishment has become our social policy for low-income men of color. And about 80% of people who are locked up are poor. For African Americans, this mass incarceration is particularly horrific. There are more black people under criminal justice supervision than there were slaves in 1850. If you're a black man without a high school degree, you're more likely to be in prison than you are to have a job. And you know, today is the 60th anniversary of the Brown versus Board of Education decision. Uh, I should point out that for blacks in criminal justice, the 1950s, man, those were the good old days. Because then the race disparities in incarceration were just three to one, as opposed to the eight to one they are now. We lock up way more people than we did in 1954 of every race. As I speak, one in 100 Americans has a criminal case. Now, we know two things about this dramatic expansion of the prison population. First, it has little to do with the crime rate. When crime goes up, prosecutors lock up more people. When crime goes down, prosecutors lock up more people. When the crime rate stays the same, prosecutors lock up more people. And we know that the great increase in blacks in criminal justice is a result of selective incarceration in the war on drugs. African Americans don't use drugs more than any other group. 12% of people who do the crime were 60% of people who do the time. Now, before Eric Holder became the first US, the first uh, attorney general, he was the first chief black prosecutor in DC. And he had this famous question he used to ask prospective prosecutors during this interview. Every single applicant got asked, how are you going to feel about locking up so many black men? <clears throat> I always wonder what the appropriate answer to that question was. What if you said, you know, I would just love that. <laughs> do the work. Now, Eric Holder's a good man. I'm sure that would have been the answer he wanted. But what his question communicated is if you feel too bad about the work of sending black people to prison, then being a prosecutor is not the job for you. And I say that's also true about Latinos, about Native Americans, and about poor people. Again, about 80% of people who are locked up are below the poverty line when they were on the outside. So if you didn't go to Stanford Law School to send low-income people to prison, then you shouldn't become a prosecutor. I became a prosecutor because I hate bullies. I stopped being a prosecutor because I hate bullies. I got my power to be a bully from, as a prosecutor from using the vast resources of the government against a defendant who was usually poor and represented by a public defender. The scales of justice were far from equal. I went in as this undercover brother who was going to change the system from the inside. What happened instead was the system changed me. It's an institutional culture thing. You want to know what we call defendants in the office where I worked? We call them douchebags and cretins. You won't be surprised to hear that people who are charged with crimes are not well thought of in prosecutor offices. Uh, there are stories about growing up in foster care, being abused as a child, suffering from addiction, not being able to find a job. Those are obstacles to your success. Like most lawyers, I was ambitious and competitive. <clears throat> and the way that you're successful in a prosecutor's office is to lock up as many people as you can for as long as you can. So the title of this debate is, Should Good People Be Prosecutors? Not Are Some Good People Prosecutors? Of course they are. The vast majority of prosecutors I served with were upright, decent people. And friends, that's just the problem. Upright, decent people have brought us mass incarceration and race disparities. Professor Marshall and Ms. Duffy are going to tell you how much discretion and power prosecutors have and how they can use that for good. But as they speak, you might wonder how all those good people using that power has wrought us the most punitive nation in the history of the world. The day-to-day -day work of prosecutors is geared towards punishing people whose lives are already messed up. Uh, if you are from a low-income background and if you've ever worked to help poor people, you know poor people, they never have just one problem. 
It's never only that the car is broken or grandma can't get to kidney dialysis or Junior needs fifteen dollars for a field trip and Ma doesn't have enough money, make enough money at Walmart to afford child care. It's all those things. And what prosecutors do is look at that person who suffered a lifetime of deprivation and hands her the bill. So in closing, two questions, one for Ms. Duffy and one for the students in the audience. Ms. Duffy, are there too many people in prison in the Southern District of California? And if so, what are you doing to reduce that number? If there are too many Latinos and African Americans and undocumented folks who are locked up. Tell us about your office's racial and economic justice initiatives. And last question for the students of this great law school. Uh, you are going to have so many opportunities to make a difference in this world. So ask yourselves, did you go to Stanford Law School to put poor and unemployed and mentally ill and undocumented people in prison? Are you graduating with $100,000 in debt so that you can lock up Latinos and African Americans and Native Americans? I respectfully suggest that the answer is no. Thank My you. friends, I don't believe you came all this way to put your people in prison. Thank you, Professor Butler. Did you come all the way to Stanford? to use your immense talents and skills and education to shy away from a challenge that so desperately needs the best, the brightest, the goodest, the most ethical, the most sensitive. The ones who, like me, share Professor Butler's absolute outrage at what's happened in the United States who understand the extent to which criminal justice is a subsection of racial justice, people who understand that the war against drugs is an utter failure that is oppressing millions and millions of families, people who understand and believe, as I do, that our immigration policies are corrupt and destined for failure, but people who say it's precisely because of those things then I need to be in a position where my voice can be heard. Precisely because of that, that I need to find a vehicle for making a change at the retail and the wholesale level. Now, I told you before that I've had a lot of experience with prosecutors. I've been involved in cases where prosecutors have been brought up on criminal charges after the fact for having tried to kill an innocent client of mine. I've been involved in cases with charges left and right of prosecutorial misconduct. Some of these have led to reversals, others haven't. I've been involved with a prosecutor who told the New York Times why he was refusing to look at our DNA evidence. He said, quote, the taxpayers don't pay us for intellectual curiosity, they pay us to get convictions, period, end quote. I like seeing that. But far from that leading me to tell you to stay away from the prosecutor's offices, it tells me to tell you, please, we need you. Because I've also seen prosecutors who acted very differently. I've seen attorney generals who have decided not to appeal a grant of habeas corpus because their lower level line attorneys have told them, no, that was justice when the judge ordered that and they were informed by the lowest of the level, I, the earliest, the, the uh, youngest recruits. I've seen cases where prosecutors have said to the judge, despite the judge's invitation, judge, I don't want the jury to see those pictures of the dead body because that's only gonna inflame their passion and it's not relevant really to the inquiry. And the judge said, no, you have a right to do it. They said, yeah. I want this to be a sober, contemplative, serious division. I've had that experience. I've seen prosecutors who have opened up DNA conviction units, integrity units, that is to say, Craig Watkins in Dallas. I've seen a prosecutor who resigned her position publicly upon coming to the conclusion that her office was proceeding in injustice. So I want to provide testimony. Testimony to you. I'll take the oath if you want to swear me that there are massive differences that affect not just the lives of those individuals, but criminal justice more generally. Now, I know Professor Butler has said 
And look, don't look at the big cases like that. But maybe there are differences. Maybe Kamala Harris, since the San Francisco DA, refused to seek the death penalty, despite the fact that it was a police officer who was killed and she was taking <coughs> immense heat. Maybe those cases are different. But I'm talking, you would say, I believe, about the run of the mill case. About the run of the mill. But what would he say about the many prosecutor offices that have instituted and been real creative catalysts for diversionary programs in drug cases? What would they say about the prosecutors who joined people in this very law school to support three strikes reform that has now led to the free of 3,000 people, or soon to be 3,000 or so people in this state? What do you would say about the immigration cases where charges either aren't brought, perhaps, or they're brought at a lower level without the same immigration consequences? And this is a key point, because the time that discretion is exercised most wisely, exercised most wisely, are often invisible. Because those are charges that aren't brought. Or those are charges that are brought at a lower level. Those aren't the charges you read about in the newspaper. Those aren't the charges that we're here to talk about. So I'm dismayed at the proposition. I'm dismayed because the proposition has a corollary. Because if you listen to him, and I believe he wants you to, if all the good people of America listen to him, and he wants you to, then who are our prosecutors? Only the people who don't give a damn about racial justice. Only the people who don't give a damn about social justice and about these issues. Now, does that mean you can go into a prosecutor's office and boom, that's it, I'm here, forget the war on drugs is over, open the prisons? Of course not. Things happen by evolution, not by revolution. Do we need people on the other side? Of course we do. We need desperately people whose affinity is to the, to the defense side. We need policy people fighting completely from the outside. But we desperately need people who are on the inside and who are fighting that side. And he says, well, young people just can't make a difference. Well, first of all, young people grow up to be old people. <laughs> and they can't make a difference. Who do we think the people who are making the policy are? Where do we think they started? typically as blind prosecutors at the lower level. So there are dues to be paid. But even at that lowest level, my understanding from a lot of conversations is at the misdemeanor level, where you start, for example, there actually is a whole lot of discretion. And you may have to go to the supervisor and clear it, but it's going to be approved in most cases because no one's paying that much attention. The smaller the case, the larger the discretion. The larger the case, the more senior you are, so the more the discretion. Now in the conversation, I think we will get to the point of the only real, I think, reasonable, plausible explanation for Professor Buckley's position is going to be that this is so immoral that it's like Nuremberg, that it's like slave trade. That to tell someone, well, go into that immoral situation because you'll be able to save a few here and there is not a morally acceptable proposition. But in both of those instances, we were ready to bomb. We were ready to go to war. We don't have a system, I submit, that is that insusceptible, non-susceptible to reform. But reform will only happen if you're willing to take on the challenge. It's not easy. It will be uncomfortable. Good things are. Good people do that. Thank you, Professor Marshall. <laughs>I will admit some unease with the question presented. Um, I have quite an aversion to saying anything at all about who good people are and what they should do with their lives. Uh, it's a big reason I was drawn to criminal defense work, uh, much less to take the 
added step of saying, I fall in the good category and some other group of people falls in the bad category. So I interpret the question presented here today to mean this. If you are a conscientious person who cares about the criminal justice system and who cares about moving it in a better direction, should you use your considerable talents as a prosecutor? And should you do so here today in this America, in this criminal justice system? And to that, I feel comfortable saying no. In the words of LeBron James, you should take your talents elsewhere. <laughs> you should find a different South Beach. Um, why do I say that? I say that because of the day-to-day -day work of most prosecutors. Not that there aren't exceptions. Not that there won't be instances where prosecutors can do good things. And not that there aren't good people who are prosecutors. But by and large, the work of prosecutors contributes to the problem. It doesn't help solve it. If you want to help solve it, you need to do it from the outside. Why do I say that? And, and by the way, I'm building upon Paul's arguments. I'm not going to reiterate all the horrifying statistics. If you don't think that mass incarceration is a serious problem in this country, if you don't think that stark racial inequality in the criminal justice system in particular is a problem, if you don't think it's a problem that we have a legal structure that doesn't really hold police officers and prosecutors accountable for their actions, then you probably won't agree with me. But if you think that those things are a problem, I think you should. And here's why. Here's what you will be doing on a day-to-day -day basis at the most fundamental level as a prosecutor. And this is just descriptive. I'm not trying to be normative about it. You will receive reports from law enforcement agents. You will receive reports from police officers and federal agents describing some alleged crime. And you will charge people based on the reports from law enforcement. And once you have charged somebody with a crime, you will try to get them to plead guilty. In a system in which more than 95% of people plead guilty, that is your most fundamental job as a prosecutor. And how will you accomplish it? You will accomplish it by offering whatever the standard offer in your office is to a plea. And you will make sure that the spread between that offer and what would happen if the person dared challenge their case, and by challenge their case, I mean either by going to trial or even just challenging police misconduct through, say, a suppression motion. You'll make sure that that's a spread large enough that people won't challenge their case. You couldn't do your job. The system couldn't function if you didn't do that. If the number just dipped to 85% of people pleading guilty, the system would crash. So that's your fundamental job. So what are you going to do when somebody doesn't take the offer and they do challenge their case? You're going to want to win. And you're going to want to win for a number of reasons. One, you're going to want to win because of who you are in this room, and I include myself in that. You are accomplished people. You are competitive people to some degree. You don't like to lose. Trust me. <laughs> Two, you will want to win because it's what our legal culture rewards. It's what law school rewards. We tell you, here's an argument to make, and you should be able to win it no matter what side you're on. Moot court, final exam, whatever it is, make a compelling, strong argument no matter what it is. So you're taught to do that. Three, the culture of your prosec prosecution office, no matter what it is, will socially and professionally reward you for reward you for winning. I've practiced in many different jurisdictions, state and federal. I've often seen prosecutors and law enforcement agents out drinking and celebrating a big win. I have never seen them out celebrating a reduced charge. <laughs> Ever. <laughs> and four, you will want to win because you will think it's the right thing to do. Again, Good people are, in fact, prosecutors, but it's like the parable of the six blind men touching different parts of the elephant. You will be grabbing the tail and think that that's the elephant. You will have a certain perspective. You have a role in your job, and it mostly comes from the law enforcement people you work with and the other prosecutors in your office. And what does this mean that you will want to win? You will make arguments about narrowing the scope of the Fourth Amendment and its protections. You will make arguments about your own power and your own authority and why it should not be challenged. You will make arguments about limiting the scope of discovery that needs to be produced to defendants, including exculpatory evidence and Brady material. And when you win, 
and someone loses, you will make arguments about sentencing severity, and you will be defending severity, and you will be advocating for severity. Think about just about any area of criminal jurisprudence, whatever area of law, fourth, fifth, sixth, eighth amendment, equal, pro uh, equal protection, due process, you will be citing those cases to your benefit that stand on the side of the government. And if you think that the state of the law is already far too much in the direction of the government on those issues, then you ought to think twice about day in, day out, arguing for those propositions. You will be doing that. That is your job. And you will be doing it with people on the other side of the aisle, as Paul said, who are 80% poor and who are, uh, by and large, black and Latino, uh, certainly far more so than uh, the population at large. So I've used up almost all of my time. What could you do instead? I don't suggest that I'm a revolutionary as a public defender. Um, I made that decision when I went to law school that I wasn't going to be Che Guevara, right? All of you did. So we're all insiders <laughs> to some degree, right? But I get to go to work every day, and the words coming out of my mouth, the arguments that I'm making, they are words about fairness, about due process, and about humanity in a system that is horribly, horribly inhumane right now. Thank you. Good afternoon. Not only am I a career prosecutor, I am a proud career prosecutor. And despite what you've heard today, I also think I'm a pretty good person. In my tenure with the Department of Justice, I have successfully prosecuted dozens of major cartel leaders, including some of the most murderous and violent leaders, individuals who are responsible for having ordered hundreds of kidnappings, shootings, beheadings, conducting torture sessions, after which they disintegrate people's bodies in acid. I do not apologize for those convictions of those billionaires and millionaires, those drug kingpins who peddled tons of narcotics into this country, narcotics like cocaine and marijuana, but methamphetamine, a drug that has led to high profile, horrific crimes in San Diego, the hijacking of a military tank, the scalding, the fatal scalding of a four-year-old girl in a bathtub. I do not apologize for convictions against child pornographers who victimize and assault children. I do not apologize for the convictions of gang members who callously assassinate their rivals without any regard for the collateral consequences that it has, or for enslaving and violating young girls and women for the sake of forcing them into prostitution and they becoming their own personal ATM accounts. I am proud of those convictions. And I am proud of the line attorneys who work in my office and who work so hard and with such commitment for the safety and security of their communities. Of course, Good people can and should be prosecutors. The profession demands it. The profession demands that every prosecutor who admittedly have a tremendous power and tremendous responsibility above all else value integrity, fairness, justice, and compassion. The universal job description for prosecutors is to do justice. And some may question what exactly that means. To do justice, to do the right thing. We are not under some kind of pressure. I do not hold my attorneys under some kind of pressure to win at all costs. Their job is to do the right thing. The right thing by the Constitution, the right thing by the rule of law, and the right thing by the community that they are sworn to serve and protect. 
You all have an opportunity to make decisions about your careers after you leave here. To be involved in the criminal justice system, you have the chance to give your voice. You have the chance to make a difference in the system. And I can tell you that prosecutors at all levels, not just those at the top who are setting policy, are making significant discretionary decisions every day that have a tremendous impact on the community in which they live. Whether you're a junior or a senior prosecutor, you have a responsibility to ensure that in the way prosecutions take place, the spirit and the letter of the Constitution is followed. It has been my experience that most prosecutors understand and fully appreciate how awesome that responsibility is. One of my rookie line assistants recently said to me about talking about his responsibility as a prosecutor, that this job is as much responsibility as when I drove a naval aircraft. And any mistake that I made could result in danger to hundreds of lives. Folks, we're going to make mistakes in this business, for sure. But the newest prosecutors, you will find out, are constantly confronted with the ability to exercise discretion to make a difference. If one of my prosecutors questions whether arrest is made on probable cause, whether a search is conducted constitutionally, or whether a confession is voluntary, then that prosecutor has the power to refuse the case. I'm not going to file it. That prosecutor has the power to request more evidence, to demand more evidence. That prosecutor has the power to dismiss the case. I would agree that our criminal justice system faces significant challenges. But the notion that good people should shun the work of a prosecutor because they don't want to perpetuate a flawed system, that's giving up. That's just giving up. Should good people simply feel that they have to give up and not have their voices heard? I think those who have been committed to justice throughout the history of this country would hang their heads in disappointment if that is what we did. We all have to continue to work for justice. And I think the only way we have a chance at achieving that and achieving it for every citizen of this country is if we hire good people in every faucet of our criminal justice system. If we build our ranks with cultural and racial diversity to represent the communities that we serve and by continuing to evaluate ourselves, by evaluating the work that we do, the policies we make, and the decisions we make, and striving always to do better. Under this administration, and particularly under Attorney General Holder, we have seen sweeping and significant reforms. Change is not only possible, it is happening right now. And you have the chance to step into that and to be a part of that. He has acknowledged that our system needs improvement, and his voice is among the loudest in advocating for prosecutors, not only to be tough on crime, crime, but to be smart on crime. And under Attorney General Holder's Smart on Crime initiatives, prosecutors across this country are looking at cases differently. They're actively assessing whether mandatory minimum drug sentences should be applied in any particular case. We're looking at not just volume of drugs involved, but the entire circumstances, the individual circumstances of a case and of a defendant in charging and coming up with sentencing decisions. We're reviewing sentencing guidelines. We're looking at disparities. And we are looking at how to make the system more fair for people who have been marginalized. I see that my time is up, and uh, I'll have some other comments to make in the discussion. Thank you. So let me get out of the firing line here so that our panelists have an opportunity to respond to each other's opening statements. And when that's concluded, I will have some questions, and I invite you to have questions as well. But at this point, let me first open it up to any of the panelists who might want to respond to any of the opening remarks. Any comments here? Uh, I'll, I'll just respond to um, uh, some of Laura's uh, recent uh, her, her, her uh, last comments about prosecuting some pretty dangerous and, and violent people. And um, uh, I, 
I would never suggest that people who do horrible, violent things shouldn't be prosecuted. I think they should. Um, but as a, uh, a good debater doing a little bit of research, I, I checked out the sentencing commission statistics on who's actually prosecuted in the Southern District of California. And 60% of the prosecutions are illegal reentry prosecutions, people who've been previously deported who come back uh, and they're given jail terms. Uh, and 30% uh, uh, are drug cases. Um, uh, and uh, and, and the, the remaining slivers, uh, a whole variety of things. So 90% of cases being prosecuted are illegal uh, reentry and drug cases. Let me let Ms. Duffy respond. Um, I'd like to respond to that in conjunction with the question posed by Professor Butler as to um, what is the United States Attorney's Office doing? What am I particularly doing to um, uh, address the incarcerations in the Southern District of California? Um, the, the Southern District of California is right on the U.S.-Mexico border. Tijuana and Mexicali are directly to our south, two of the most populous uh, cities in Mexico. And so one, one of our obligations um, is the, the national security of this country and, and making sure that that border is a secure border uh, and not just being penetrated. Uh, one of the things uh, that we are constantly involved in doing is stopping narcotics that flow into the United States through our border, uh, through our border, through our ports of entry, in between our ports of entry. And uh, as uh, David said, uh, immigration work. One of the things that we have been doing um, in the Southern District of California, it, particularly in these two areas of, of crime, uh, drugs and immigration, is in 2010 we started a diversion program. Uh, and, and I completely agree with the, the need to uh, look at the, the, the way in which drug and immigration uh, statutes and penalties are handled in this country. One of the things we've been doing since 2010 is we began a diversion program, a court-supervised diversion program that give uh, some categories, including drug and immigration categories, uh, of defendants a second chance. And we give them a second chance through this program they are able to receive uh, drug counseling, they're able to receive em uh, employment uh, assistance, education, uh, job placement. And it is through those kind of programs, we've seen 600 people uh, come through this program. 90% of, of them have graduated from this program with only a 2.2% recidivism rate. So this kind of a program has a very uh, promising future, especially when you look at the rates of recidivism for people who are leaving incarceration are much higher. Uh, so while the, the, the work of the Southern District of California is very much generated by our geographic placement on the border, we are looking at ways in which uh, we can move short of comprehensive immigration reform or short of uh, minimum mandatory and other drug reforms to address it in our district. Professor Butler. So there was some pushback on the idea about whether people who are prosecutors now are good. The answer is clearly yes. I'd suggest that Ms. Duffy, Duffy is exhibit A. She's a good person who in her office, 90% of the cases are drug cases or immigration cases. So that's what good prosecutors do, 90% those kinds of crimes. Uh, the other thing is that prosecutors, no matter how good they are, are still stuck with the cases that the police bring them. It's not like you could say, I want to be a prosecutor, but I don't want to do cases that are the result of pretextual stops or racial profiling or police lying to uh, suspects or selective enforcement of drug laws in black communities. That would be like saying, I want to work as, I want to, um, uh, work at Scott Arps, but I don't want to represent rich people. Uh, for better or worse, as a prosecutor, the police are the people who bring you the work, and your main task is to defend the evidence that they have collected, not to criticize them for how they got it. Professor Marshall. So what I'm hearing is basically, to paraphrase, I think it's Disraeli, it may have been Churchill, that good prosecutors are really in a terrible situation in a very bad context, but I would say, except for the alternative, which is bad prosecutors. If she resigns, the war on drugs and the war on immigration is not stopping. It's just going to be in the hands of somebody who, according to you and David, just aren't good. And is that going to make the world better? 
I mean, this is about ultimately incrementalism. It's about do we say this is a bad situation so we stay out. As David was talking, I was thinking about when we hear about the crisis in the South, particularly in death penalty defense, the sweeping lawyers, the drunk lawyers, the incompetent lawyers. When you hear that, does anybody say, so therefore don't become a defense lawyer because there's a bad situation out there? Or do people say, that's the exact precise reason we need you and do we encourage you to run there? Now, I am not naive about the institutional pressure. And I think people need to know themselves. So if you know you are someone who tends to get caught up in a certain culture, swept up, and you're going to an office where you're not necessarily confident that they have the commitment that you have, then yes, you need to know your limitations. This isn't for everybody. If you're not someone who's dogmatic enough to be able to argue someone should be in prison, I'm not, then you shouldn't be a prosecutor. But my God, if you are someone who can do that, and if you do feel like you have the fortitude to be a voice for good, to be someone who says, we do have to turn over that material, if, to be a prosecutor who says, we are going to have an open files policy, the fact is, heroes are rare, they tell us. And uh, you know, I've read your work, and, and you talk about, oh, yes, there's this great prosecutor and this exciting one, but they're very rare. And I've got news for you. If you get your way, They'll be extinct, not just rare. So let me let, uh, I'm going to ask David and Paul to answer that very precise question, which is the alternative. If the good people don't become prosecutors, then will we have a worse situation? I, I, I would start by, by going back to what it is you're going to be arguing day in and day out as a prosecutor. Um, and by and large, you're going to be arguing for a greater uh, accretion of power, regardless of how you use that power, regardless of whether you use that power for good or bad. It's not unlike asking, should good people be dictators, right? I mean, it's not unlike saying, should it, because you're good and you would be in a position to do uh, good things by ruling uh, the world by ruling your little county in criminal justice. Um, if you're a good person, you should do that because you would make good decisions and, and exercise your discretion wisely. I think it's a problem to have dictators. I think we now have a criminal justice system in which prosecutors simply have too much power, that law enforcement has too much power, that it doesn't go checked. And most of what you're doing on a daily basis is pushing back against anyone checking your authority, however you're using that authority. And so even if you happen to be good, the arguments you're making and the precedents you're setting are allowing 10 others to do bad things with it. And let me have you respond to that, uh, Professor Marshall and Ms. Duffy, which is the idea that clearly, as the side has admitted, there are good people who have become prosecutors. I see some in the room today. But bad things still happen. There are wrongful convictions. There's overuse of charging. There's the racial disparity. How do you respond to that? Bad things are going to happen. We're not going to stop there uh, from being prosecutors who believe in winning at all costs. We're not going to be able to stop um, prosecutors having the mentality that some of the defendants they are prosecuting are less than they um, and they can be called douchebags, and they can be called credence. We're not going to stop that. There are going to be people in the world who have that view. But if you are a person with integrity and ethical sensibilities, uh, and you are a person who has a sense of fairness and uh, doing the right thing, you have the opportunity to enter into the criminal justice system as a prosecutor. You have an opportunity to expand what is what traditional law enforcement is. And I think one of the most important things that's happening in this country right now under Attorney General Holder's leadership is that we are expanding the definition of traditional law enforcement beyond investigating and litigating. And we're expanding it to that plus looking at and getting to the bottom of what are some of the conditions that create crime in the first place. It, whether we look at the epidemic of methamphetamine and prescription drug abuse that's rampant in every state across this country, or if we look at discrete uh, tragedies like the Boston Marathon bombing or the Newtown School shootings, 
we're reminded that we need to be aware of, we need to be understanding, we need to be working with expert uh, subject, subject area experts and understanding the sociological, the psychological, the uh, ideological factors that lead to abuse, that lead to violent crime. And, and Laura, let me let, I extremism. see Paul's almost jumping out of his skin here. <laughs> and as he is, I'd like any of you who have questions for this debate to start approaching the microphones so that we'll hear those as well. But let me have Professor Butler respond on this point. And I'm going to add one thing to it, since this may be my last opportunity. How about the thought that if prosecutors don't change things, they may not get change? Because when it comes to the political process, it's unlikely that Congress will be listening to anybody other than prosecutors for these reforms. It's the prosecutors who have the gravitas to make the changes that we might all want. You know, I, I actually wasn't jumping at the bit because every time Ms. Duffy speaks, she so, shows her, her decency, her humanity. She's a good person, and the work that her office is doing, 90% of the work is prosecuting undocumented workers and people who use and sell drugs. Now, I don't think that 90% of the most immoral and dangerous people in the Southern District of California are undocumented workers and drug users. But that's what her work tells us. You know, part of this is a familiar debate uh, about how much you can change a system from the inside. So if those of you who agree that good people should be prosecutors, maybe you also think if you want to help the environment, you should go and work for British Petroleum or for Exxon. Because that way you can choose the poisonous chemicals. That way you can let a few pristine bays remain untouched. I, I wouldn't call you an environmentalist. I would call you a polluter with a conscience. I just wanted to right. add one thing to this. Of course. I mean, as I'm hearing all this, two words keep coming to mind, or four words, two sets of two. One is Ralph Nader. Ralph Nader. There is no difference between George Bush and Al Gore. They're all of one ilk, so we might as well just forget. It doesn't make a difference which of them gets elected. Make a statement by basically sitting it out and voting for me. If you believe in that, if you really believe there was no difference between George Bush and Al Gore, whether you're coming from the right or the left, then OK, this may be for you. But secondly, I want to know what the end game is here. Weir does, and it's sort of what Laurie said. So we get all these good people say no. Butler, Patton, I'm with them. I'm staying away. And all across the country, that's what people do. So we get harsher prosecutors without the sensibilities, without the goodness. What's the end game? How does that ultimately help anybody? Let's start with our questions. Sir, please state your name and the question. Brief questions, and they must be questions. OK, I'm, I'm Bob Gordon. I'm on the Stanford Law faculty, and um, I have a question actually for, for the whole panel, and that is, hasn't David Patton got the problem right? The, uh, that is to say that the problem is the concentration of power in these prosecutors' offices. The, we shouldn't be having to ask the question about whether good people can save a flawed system, a system that depends exclusively on the goodness of the character of the people in it to save it is a bad system. The problem with prosecutors is that they're un-American. Oh. They violate every principle of the separation of powers. I I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to yeah. focus that question, <laughs> Professor. <laughs> Can I, is, can I answer whether I'm right? Do we need right? to jettison our entire criminal justice system? <laughs> so, it, Sir. Could, 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 could I just supplement it with one more question? Don't you think that we would get somewhere? I think David Patton's right. Prosecutors have got to lead the charge because they're the only political actors that anybody listens to. If they would lead the charge to constructing a system of restraints, institutional restraints, reviews, and remedies for their own abuses of power, that would be the way to fix it. Thank you, Professor. Let's have David. You had a comment, and then I, any response? <laughs> uh, my, my comment was yes. <laughs> uh, Are there any? Yes, you're uh, right. You, you got it right. <laughs> um, no, I, I mean, I, I, I do think that's the fundamental problem. In, in an era of mandatory minimums, where prosecutors, prosecutors have traditionally had a lot of power, charging power. But in the past few decades, we have moved to hyperpower. 
power on steroids. They don't just control the charging decision at the outset. They control, by and large, the entire process because of their stranglehold on sentencing authority as well. Next question. Uh, when, but, if, but if cars are driving too fast, we should slow them down, not put drunk drivers at the wheel. <laughs> It, it's, it's more like we shouldn't expect the drunk drivers to slow themselves down. Please. Um, so my question is name? about... I'm sorry. My name is Riley Summers Flanagan. I'm um, a Stanford Law student, a 1L, and um, I am really excited that you're all here. So my question is, if we took a step back and ask sort of where, where the, the question is coming from, um, I think we're asking whether there's a fundamental problem with our adversarial system in some ways. And so I'm curious to what degree you think that's true or not true, and whether you think that the adversarial nature of the system can be changed with prosecutors and public defenders Thank or you. defenders. Let me see. Any comments on this from the panelists? <laughs> Professor Marshall. I, I think there are a lot of areas of possible change. I mean, this is radical, but a British-type system when there's actually some switching around of positions that creates a bit more objectivity, having every prosecutor going through a place where actually having represented individuals and understanding that humanity, I want radical, radical change as much as anyone in this system. We're just arguing how you get there. That's really all we're arguing about. And, and again, if we think about the arguments that prosecutors make, I don't think a lot of my friends who are prosecutors actually believe those arguments. I have so many African-American friends who are cops and prosecutors who, if they're walking down the street, they get profiled just like the people who they um, bring cases against. You know, even if you look at the kinds of arguments that prosecutors are making to the Supreme Court now, like if you get arrested, prosecutors argued recently, for driving with a suspended license. The police should have the right to take your cell phone and look at your text messages and your photos just because you got arrested. Prosecutors make those arguments. Next question, Thank please. you, Jonathan Simon, UC Berkeley. So I was the philosopher Nietzsche pointed out that, uh, that there's good versus evil and good versus bad. And I, I think in this argument, you've been assuming that the opposite of good is evil. And I agree that we don't want prosecutors that are inhumane, evil, believe in degrading people. But what about just bad prosecutor, incompetent, not very good lawyers, people who are wonderfully humane, deeply compassionate, just not the sharpest tools in the shed. One, given the huge disbalances in our system now, uh, in fact, that lead to some improvement. I ask that just slightly tongue-in-cheek. <laughs> I'll, I'll, I'll flip it. I'll, I'll just flip it and say we are in much more desperate need of Stanford law grads and their ilk and the credibility and the prestige that comes with you and your talents in other areas, in the South, as public defenders, parts, uh, being part of a program like Gideon's Promise, being in a policy group, speaking up with your talents and your intelligence and your connections against the system because you will not do it as a prosecutor. You might make individual good decisions. You will not work to reform the system as a prosecutor. Let me get a quick response on that, and we'll take our last question. I have spent, in cases, five or 6,000 hours trying as a defense lawyer to undo what a prosecutor could have decided in half a second to decide otherwise, and many prosecutors would have. So do we need awesome defense lawyers? Absolutely. But the idea, that adage that you can do more justice sometimes in an hour as a prosecutor than a defense lawyer can do in five years, it is true. I can testify to that personally. We need to make this brief so that we can get our closing arguments. You have the last question. Beth Colgan here at Stanford Law School. One of the things that Ms. Duffy said was that, that you know, it's sort of an absence of, in the absence of comprehensive drug reforms. We're doing the best we can to create reform. But the, that suggests that prosecutors aren't involved in the process of drug reform, whereas what we have right now in Congress is legislation pending that would actually result in comprehensive drug reform that prosecutors, and in particularly federal level prosecutors, are attempting to kill. And so one of the suggestions that I, I wonder about the response of the panel is, wouldn't the best thing to do if you want reform of the prosecutor's office be to, to attempt to lobby for legislation that actually takes away some of that prosecutorial power? And I need a brief response from both sides. Um, I, I think you just, you, you raise a good point, period, that a, a lot of um, 
what Professor Butler's um, arguments are against is are, lies with the legislative bodies in this country, uh, the laws that are on the books and the changes that could be made uh, by Congress. Actually, Attorney General Holder and the department leadership support um, some of the uh, mandatory minimum and other drug reforms that are currently um, before uh, the Congress. Thank you. And I, I applaud what Attorney General Holder is doing, but he could have been doing it in 2009. Why didn't he? He's not pushing the reform agenda. You know who is? Rand Paul. Thank you. Partiers who are against mandatory minimums and who are actually being true to a notion of limited government. Thank you. So this is an opportunity <clears throat> now for our panelists to give their final two minutes each closing argument, at which point you will be weighing in again with your other ballot, and we will see if positions have changed. Again, I would ask Professor Butler, and I'd ask for everyone's courtesy for these closing arguments. Uh, so thank you so much, Professor Levinson and, uh, Levinson and Professor uh, uh, Lucy for organizing this. One day, ladies and gentlemen, uh, we're going to look back at American criminal justice at the dawn of the 21st century, and history is going to be our judge, and it is not going to judge us well. We have degraded our fellow human beings we have often selectively apply, applied that degradation to poor people and to racial minorities. We have eroded civil liberties and all to no good end. We're less safe and less free as a result of the dysfunction in our system. And one day somebody's going to ask, well, what did you do? And if your answer is, well, I participated by making arguments that help lock people up and making arguments against expansive interpretations of the Bill of Rights, and I suggest History is not going to judge you kindly. Just as Clarence Thomas said that when he was a judge in the Superior Court, he used to look, a, a judge in the um, U.S. Court of Appeals, he used to look out the window of his chambers and see all these young black men filing into criminal court in chains and think, there but for the grace of God go I. President Obama, same phrase, there but for the grace of God go I. My friends, the determination of who goes to criminal court in chains should not be so fortuitous. It should not depend so much on race and class. As long as it does, we need the law students in this room, some of our best and brightest, not to be complicit. It's not giving up, Miss Duffy. It's dreaming bigger. You can make a difference. I remember Margaret Mead's words that we should never doubt that a small group of committed people can change the world. Indeed, it's the only thing that ever has. Thank you, Mr. The Professor Butler. <laughs> we should never doubt that a small group of committed people can change the world. The only thing that ever has. Apparently, they can change the world, but they can have no impact within prosecutor offices. I haven't heard a word about an alternative to my argument that we need to make sure that the best and most humane and most ethical people are occupying those positions of power. If you want to dissolve that power, let's talk about that. If you want to remove the war on drugs, let's talk about that. But that's not going to happen because you sit out and feel cleaner about yourself. It's lovely not to have to feel dirty sometimes when it's in furtherance of a greater good. But that luxury comes at the expense of the lives that you could save were you with your sensibilities at that table, of the people that you could keep from prison, of the three strikers that you could let out. Now, you're entitled to feel good. There's no moral imperative that I know of that says you have to make yourself uncomfortable for the sake of others. And good people can decline that mission and that challenge. But if you're not going to do this from the inside, then you need to do something very strong from the outside. And my belief is they're not mutually exclusive. It has been said, the gravitas comes from the insider. That's where the change is effected. But small groups of people can change institutions. It's all that ever has. Thank you, Professor Marshall. Mr. Patton, your final remarks. I'll respond to what Larry just said by saying I, it, all we hear 
from that side are instances, discrete instances, where good prosecutors do the right thing. I have yet to hear any instance where a prosecutor is truly working to fundamentally change the structure that creates these problems in the first place. Um, and I want to close by getting a little personal, talking about a fantasy I have. Um, and don't worry, it's a really boring fantasy. <laughs> um, the fantasy is this. I learned that on a, it's a federal prosecutor's last day in the office, and they're headed off to private practice, and I get to meet them on the front steps of the office, and I get to present them with a sealed envelope, and I say, hold on to this envelope. Keep it in your pocket. Don't do anything with it until I ask you to. And then weeks later, months later, years later, whenever it is that I get a phone call, and I get these phone calls all the time. When this former prosecutor calls me and starts railing against the policies in the US Attorney's Office, or the, they are screwing my client this way, that way, the other way. They are being so incredibly inhumane. They are violating due process this way, that way, the other way. And it will all, this 20 minute stem winder will end with the exact same thing every time. When I was in the office, I never did this. At which point I will say, take the envelope out, <laughs> open it. And on a single sheet of paper, the only thing that will be written was, yes, you did. And Ms. Duffy. The motion raised uh, by Professor Butler and David Patton is good people shouldn't be prosecutors. Good people are, should, and can be prosecutors. Our system needs them, period. If, if we look at the power that prosecutors and defense attorneys have, if, if we're going to argue that 95% of what a prosecutor does is plead out people and send them to jail. 95% of what defense attorneys in this country are doing is getting their clients to accept pleas. This is not a system that is so broken that it's an indefensible system. It is a system that has challenges. It is a system that has flaws. And it is a system that needs good people to work constantly to reform and better it. I want good people on the inside doing that. Good people on the inside may have more power to do that. If you see injustices, work to change them. Work to reform it. If, if we, God forbid, were to say everyone with a conscience, everyone grounded in integrity, everybody with a sense of fairness, everybody with ethical sensibilities, forget it. Shun the work of a prosecutor. What kind of a criminal justice system and what kind of a country would we have? Not a good one. Thank you. to the end and just stay for it. It'll be, take about two minutes to tally. I'd like to give uh, the final numbers to our panel. As you do, I know we often speak, shh, my turn, my turn. I know we often speak about winners and losers, the adversarial system in the world, but I think we can all agree today on this panel for this debate. We had only winners. Please join me in thanking them. Are you right? So we moved it, so it's now. Um, oh, now the numbers are changing. Okay. No, this is it. This is it. This yeah. is the new number. This okay, the, okay, and then we'll put the. So the way this works, if you have not seen a debate like this before, is we're going to put the after numbers after the debate. But that does not tell us the winner or the loser. It's depending on the percentage change. So um, I'm going to put the numbers up now. O only at Stanford. <laughs> <laughs> and I think it would be best if you kind of closed your eyes so I could announce them. <laughs> 
And that means that at the end, they tell me that the change, they don't know if it's right. <laughs> but according to them, we have an absolute tie. Let's hear it for the debate. Hey. <laughs> on the other hand, on the other hand, if they were good in math, they would be in medical school. I'm going to, one last minute, one last minute, please. Um, it's not a tie It's not a tie. No, we got, <laughs> we got creamed. All right. Uh, it's not a tie. Please, please, let me just end it this way. I don't think the numbers are the important part, although they're very telling. <laughs> Uh, yeah, I, I think that uh, well, the important part is what all of us take away from this debate and what we could have learned. The numbers are important, of course. They can help us evaluate where we stand and what we learn. But I want to thank all of you for being here and having such an energetic, enthusiastic involvement in such an amazing and informative debate. Once again, thank you so much. Wow, we really got cool.